Uh, my name is Randy Rogers, and thank you for sticking it out to the last presentation. This stage is going to drive me crazy. I'm a hyperactive person, and I like to walk around a lot. Um, uh, but uh, I am an, I'm the director of digital learning services for Seguin Independent School District. And if you are not from, well, pretty much Seguin, or at least the San Antonio area, you probably don't have any idea where that is. Uh, maybe if you're from other parts of Texas, but it's about 30 miles to the east. If you're headed to Houston, you would pass by Seguin on I-10. Um, I have uh, been there for the last year. I've been in uh, public education for 24 years. This is my 24th year. I know it's hard to tell. You were probably guessing 10 or 12, uh, but it's true. Uh, I taught elementary school, taught middle school, and been in the instructional technology side of the game for about 11 years now. And uh, took on a new challenge by moving to Seguin last year, and uh, from a district where that had become really established as kind of a leader in some of the things we were doing with technology, um, uh, to take on, you know, and we had a team of 12 of us that were just the specialists, plus a couple of directors and things like that, and went to a pretty good-sized district where I'm the director and I'm also the specialist and I'm also the custodian and. I sometimes have to run the cafeteria and things like that. It's a, it's a lot of tasks, but it's been a lot of fun. Uh, a little background about our district before I start on this so you can uh, kind of know how it compares maybe to your own. We are um, about, I'm going to get the number wrong, I'm sure, but I think, I believe we're in the 70 to 73 percent free and reduced lunch range. Uh, we have uh, a very large Hispanic population. Uh, the rest is kind of just balanced, uh, but it's, uh, it's a neat community. It's a very working class community, but it also has some, some high-tech industries. Caterpillar has a big plant there. Uh, there's a company called Hexcel that makes like uh, uh, Kevlar and makes carbon fiber stuff. So you have some really high-tech industries that are home there. Uh, so it's, it's a really, it's a unique little community. It's a nice community. It's right on the Guadalupe River. Um, and uh, one of the things that I've spent the last year kind of doing is kind of assessing where the technology was in the district and just trying to, you know, play it based on their needs as far as what we were trying to roll out in, in terms of what we were doing with the classroom technology uh, with our kids in the district. Um, like I said, the district I come from, we, were, we had kids blogging and making videos and putting them on YouTube, and we had a very uh, uh, big, huge robotics program at the high school level with waiting lists to get on it. I mean, technology played a, played a big, was a very big player there. And um, one of the things I found as I moved to this new district was it wasn't as much in the daily routine of teachers. And, but more concerning to me and, and something that, I, that this, what this presentation is sort of about is I saw the level of technology use, and maybe you can identify with this, was usually at a pretty low level. We had my teachers would take, take their kids to a lab and make a PowerPoint or write a paper, or do some internet research, or play, you know, a math game or something like that. Can anybody identify that sounds like most of the teachers in your district? Okay. Um, and that's all right. That's a start. You get them familiar with the technology, but we certainly, that's not going to be enough for our society as, uh, in, in this country or any other country to really continue its leadership role is for our kids to limit themselves to that. So, uh, after couple of influences, I'll tell you, I'm going to give you some books to read that if you want to read these books, you can just skip this presentation. I'm just kidding. Don't skip it. But uh, Tony Wagner, his latest book called Creating Innovators, very good book, very good read. He profiles young innovators that are doing either technological innovations or social innovations, really just trying to change the world, and kind of profiles what their families were like, what their schools were like, what kind of kids they were, so you could, it's really interesting because you'll start to see it in your own kids and, you know, in your own schools and your own families. Um, and then another one, um, Susie Boss, who's done some presentations here and just uh, has got a wonderful, real practical book called Bringing Innovation to School. And anyway, those are a couple books I've read in the last year that kind of really started getting me thinking this way. I'd really been focusing largely on the creativity side for the last couple of years as I worked with my teachers, you know, giving kids the chance to be creative with their technology. I did a lot of presentations at conferences about that. But the innovation side, which we'll you see how it's a little different, has kind of been my focus in, in, this, in my district because I saw it as a need. So well, enough of the intro. Let's kind of get into it. I like this quote, first of all. This kind of set the tone. Do uh, you know who Jasper Johns is? Some of you may, if you don't know who he is, look him up. You, you've seen his art. 
Uh, he's a painter, a contemporary painter that's just got some, has uh, some, some very familiar artwork that you've seen. But do something, do something to that, and do something to that. And uh, that'll just kind of set the tone for this. And let's kind of talk about the difference between creativity and innovation really quickly. And I know uh, every, probably most of you are familiar with Sir Ken Robinson, and he, he has some great works. Also, his books are excellent reads about creativity and how to foster creativity and why we need to do that with our kids. Um, but here's his definition of creativity, the process of having original ideas that have value. And I want to point out a couple of things about his definition. One is that it's a process, which I like because I've always said, you know, I've heard people say, well, first of all, how many, and he, this is his old trick, so I'm stealing it, but how many of you in here would say you're a creative person? About eight. Okay, now, if this, now imagine you're a kindergartner, just for a minute. Everybody got yourself in that mindset? How many of you are creative people? Raise your hand if you're a creative person. Okay, and the ones that didn't, you just didn't understand the question or something. You're, you were looking at a butterfly out the window or something. Uh, no, but isn't that funny how we go? We trans, you know, we sort of transform from seeing ourselves as creative to not creative. So, you know, I, I personally believe that that's that's not the case. I believe it's still there. We just sort of have to teach people how to how to get that creativity out of them. And that's one of the things that Sir Sir Ken emphasizes that it's a process that can be taught. You can teach people how to come up with creative ideas. And another thing about his definition is that it says that have value. And one of the things um, that I think is important about that is it doesn't mean it necessarily has value right then in that situation, in that moment, but at some point it will have value. And when it is applied in a certain way. Does that make sense? And really when you get to that application parts, when you switch over to innovation. Um, here's some definitions dealing with innovation. A new match between a solution and a need. So maybe the creative side was that actual solution. The innovative side was matching it with, a, with some, some other scenario or some other uh, environment that made it solve a problem. Um, here's another definition um, from uh, John Kao, business author. The ability of individuals, companies, and entire nations to continuously create their desired futures. This is why it's important to us to have our kids become innovators is because really our collective nations, you know, uh, whichever, whoever you're representing in here, it, futures do rely on us developing innovators. Um, and also, um, Michael Porter said this, innovation is the central issue in economic prosperity. And here's another thing to sort of back that up. Um, this is Thomas Friedman. Hopefully it works. Come on, Wi-Fi. It's been really good, so I'm going to skip it. Anyway, he's, he, if it comes up, it comes up. But what Thomas Friedman is talking about in this little short clip, which you can actually find on the link that's up there, that's uh, Tony Wagner's got a series of his videos that go along with his book on Vimeo. And if you go to Vimeo and search Creating Innovators, really interesting series. I like some of them that really profile the young people that are innovators. You can see some just really amazing minds at work. But what he is talking about is that the the net growth in jobs in the United States in the last few years has been through startups. Um, and that and startups that started startups and so on. Uh, and you know we've got some emphasis on you know, we've got some startups pitching their products here. These innovative ideas is where we're going to continue to lead the global economy or not continue to lead the global economy. Um, all right, so things that have to, ways to foster innovation. All right, here's another quote by Tony Wagner, and this is important: is that one of the sometimes uh, the way we approach things, and and certainly we're legislated this sometimes, but is that we think more. Faster, harder education, bigger education is the way to solve the problem. And he really advocates an entirely different form of education. Um, now, understanding that, by the way, I know the realities of public schools. I, I work in public schools. I know that when I talk to my teachers and I say, you need to be doing these things to promote creativity and innovation in their classroom, they're, what, what do you think their very common response that limits them might be? What's that? Time, and especially because what is their time devoted to? The tests, yes. Okay, so, uh, but I think what Tony Wagner and what others 
you know, there's many other experts will, will say, and there's plenty of research to back it up, is that by creating a different type of learning environment that really promotes higher level thinking skills and solving problems, whether it's project-based learning, um, a maker type setting or whatever, actually benefits the way kids think and their test scores go up. But that, it takes a lot of faith that, you know, especially for people that aren't real familiar with how to make it happen in their classroom. So here's some things that innovators need. They need to know, they need to be able to ask questions. And I've heard this mentioned um, in different presentations this week. It is a very high level task to create good quality questions based on what you just learned or what you've been learning. And very rarely, I know when I was in the classroom, I didn't have my kids ask questions. I had them answer my brilliant questions. Um, whereas asking questions, you know, what, what does this stir in your mind is a much higher level form of thinking, isn't it? And it takes practice. When you first start doing it with children, they're terrible at it. Um, so the idea that they, you know, if kids are going to become innovators, they need to look at something and say, well, I don't understand this. Explain how this works. They need to have a chance to observe. One of the cool things, um, you know, this is it's an experiential thing. Kids need the opportunity to see other innovators at work, to see people creating things and building things and designing things, whether it's their classmates that they're watching or they're going to some uh, industry or business that does it. They need the chance to experiment, and they also need the chance to network. This is a, a critical thing, whether it's creativity or innovation. Neither one of these are generally done these days in a solitary you know, the mad scientist with the really bad hair sitting in his lab by himself creating and inventing things. It's usually done as a team. There's, you know, you go to work for a corporation and you're part of this team to develop this or whatever, you know. That's, and that, we need to give our kids chances to do that as well. So it's questions versus answers. I like this too. This is, uh, y'all familiar with, I know it's been shown about here and there during the, during the conference, uh, Makey Makey. I'll show you, if you haven't seen it before, some of you are going to be uh, volunteers or victims, whatever you want to call it, here in a little bit with it. And uh, I'll show you what it is, but it's an invention device. And I like this quote by him. I love things with more questions than answers. And I think most kids absolutely think that way. It's about consuming versus creating. Purposeful play. Giving kids the opportunity to do fun stuff that teaches them things that they can experiment with. And... I, and the idea that mistakes are good if used right, okay? And we'll I'm address that in a little bit with a, with a real example from working with my own kids in, in our district. And I love this quote by Zuckerberg. Move fast and break things. At the end of the day, the goal of building something is to build something, not to not make mistakes. And so I would throw this question at you based on those preceding statements. A or B, does that sound like most classrooms? How many say A? So nobody works in that district. I would like to come work for you if you said A. Uh, B, I think B is what we would all say. Um, so let's talk about some of the things that we're doing. What, in my district, I would say that's the same thing. It would be A, for sure. Are there pockets of difference? Yeah, of course. We all know those teachers that are just doing amazing things to help build these kinds of skills with their kids. But... One of the things as we started seeing this in our, in our district, and I started seeing what was happening in the tech classes, I said we, they need opportunities to do some more innovative things. So for this year, what I did is I set up an after-school program. And I called it our mascot or the Matador. So we are, it's called Matador Innovators Team. See the initials there? That, okay, MIT of Seguin. Uh, and there's our logo, which is... Um, Yes, it's, it's definitely a nod to MIT's logo, but the, the part of that, and I met someone from MIT yesterday when I got the opportunity to go to this makerspace, and she was just wonderful. And we were, I was talking about, I said, I'm trying to brainwash my kids, I'll admit that. That I, it doesn't matter that you're from Seguin or something even, you know, tinier and with only one red light like White Oak, Texas or something like that. You can go, you can aspire to do whatever you want. If you want to be the next great engineer, and go to MIT or go to Stanford or go to Cal, you know, Berkeley or Harvard or wherever, you can certainly do that. So, yeah, there's a little brainwashing there. Um, I figured I'd take it in the district. My daughter, since she was three, has said, I'm going to Harvard. So I just think i figure out how she's going to pay for it. But um, So th this was set up with just the opportunity for kids to explore technologies and kind of ask questions and experiment with things and make things and just have some fun while they... Uh, 
uh, learn these innovation skills. So, so here's some of the resources that we've used and how they've worked for us. One is Scratch. Now, if you, I know you've probably everybody in this room has heard of Scratch, and maybe you've never tried it. It's, it's this the best time to try it because they just made it where you don't even have to download it. It is fully web-based. Um, it's a neat, what Scratch does is it allows you to use a click and drag interface to create programming. You're not writing code and all of that, but it works at a pretty high level because you do still have to understand like the cause and effects, the sequence of events and things like that that go into writing a good program. If I click this button, I want this to happen and this to happen, or if this character runs into this color, I want this sentence to display. The neat thing about the Scratch community as well is it is a community. There are, you can see, almost three million projects saved to the community. And even better, they encourage you to take those projects, deconstruct them and tweak them and make them your own. So you can download any project from scratch, totally change it and alter it in any way you want and make it the way, you know, make it in your own, um, in your mind's own image. So it's a really neat community. Uh, everything is free. Of course, this was by MIT. So, uh, and by the way, Every resource that I show you as we go through this last part, I'll give you a link at the end. So if you don't want to write them all down, I've got them all listed. So, um, but uh, I, I, and by the way, as I started my Scratch, I mean my after school program, my MIT group this year, I didn't know how to use Scratch at all. Okay, that's not true. I knew how to like make the cat kind of go back and forth on the screen. The, that's about it. So I uh, went and watched some videos. Tried to stay one step ahead. That failed after two weeks. I was already behind the kids. Um, but I found that they were just going to YouTube and said, there's a video right here that will show us how to do what we want. And they were, or else, you know, they would go to the next group. This is one of the beautiful things is the amount of collaboration that was happening. And they would say, I saw you made your character do that. How did you do that? And they would come see it. Or ultimately, after about four weeks of working with Scratch, they figured out, they saw it on somebody else's game that they didn't even know, and they went and they looked at their code and just copied that code, made their, their characters or their background or whatever. Yes, ma'am. The kids I've been working with this year are third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. And it's, it's worked perfectly for as young as third. I've got one I'll show you a little later that I think might be better for younger, but certainly, I mean, Scratch is not an intimidating thing to play around with, but I'll show you an app a little later that I think is even easier for maybe primary kids, and it teaches the same kind of, with the same kind of setup. So, um, and, and the thing is, this is like a stepping stone to learning how to do something else, like learn how to do Java or whatever. Um, Alice is another one that we could use as the kids get more advanced. Uh, there, there's several that, you know, will take them up to a little higher level, but this was great for starting them out. Another tool that we're using, okay, this one is called, now can I get that out of the way? Can I get the uh, Elmo turned on for a second? Okay, this is called a Pico board. Cost about $45, and this was developed at MIT also, I believe. Okay, but it works with Scratch very well, and what it does, it has several features, like you see right here, it has a light sensor it has a button, a standard button. It has even um, electrical resistance sensors where you can plug in connectors, hook it up, up, up to something, and it control your program based on an object's the amount of electricity going through it. It's got uh, an audio sensor here, and it's got a slide control here. Um, plugs in with USB, doesn't require any extra power or anything like that. But what it allows them to do then is to take their game and they can, instead of just making it controlled with computer keys and things like that, they can make it audio or, and I say game, it doesn't have to be a game. We had one, I had one group of students working on a motion sensing alarm and it was, it was very alarming, the sound. They, they, and you can record your own sounds in Scratch and it was like screaming intruder, intruder at the top of its lungs. But it worked with the light sensor so that when a shadow passed over it, the alarm went off. Um, so it's a nice way to supplement Scratch and uh, kind of take it to a higher level by adding these various controls that you don't have with a regular mouse or keyboard. All right, back to the laptop, please. Thanks, sir. 
Another thing that we've been using is Makey Makey, and I'm going to have to have volunteers here for this one. But um, Makey Makey, again, was invented by a couple of guys in the uh, Media Lab at MIT. It is, um, they, they call it just an invention kit for beginners, and it is just absolutely one of the coolest things. Um, after we had done a few of these things for a few weeks, they asked me to come show the school board what we were doing in our after school program. And so I brought kids up there, and it was really cute seeing my fourth graders say, to our superintendent, would you like to come down and play our makey makey piano that used bananas for, panana for piano keys? And she did, and she played very well too, I might add, especially if she's listening by any, any chance. Um, she's very talented. Uh, but, uh, you know, they, other than the fruit flies that took over the room from the bananas they hid, but uh, it was really a, a successful thing, and they took it in a lot of different ways. Jay Silver, the, one of the two guys that invented it, I, I, I read an interview that he did just a couple weeks ago, and he was talking about, he's fascinated because he had a dad contacting him, talking about how he was using this device to create things for his uh, son with cerebral palsy to help him do things on the computer more easily and stuff. And then he said and he's got other people that are using their pizza to play Pac-Man. So it goes a lot of different ways. It can be used for a lot of different things. But just to kind of show you how it works, I need... Four volunteers. You two, thank you, and, and you two right there, good. I told you if you sat on the front row, I was going to pick on you. Okay, you have to come up here because you're going to be, they're going to be, this, they're gonna, we're going to make the human piano. I have to. All right. So, Holly, if you will just, all you have to do is hold your hand out, and I'm not going to clip you, just hold it. Oh, good. These use alligator clips. It's also got little um, kind of prongs that you can stick into things like the fruit. The kids like to make them out of fruit. Anything that conducts electricity. I, I have uh, purchased copper tape. I also got this. This is actually conductive paint, which apparently is made from solid gold based on the price of it on Amazon. Um, but uh, that allows you to paint anything and make it conduct electricity. So what are some things that you could make computer controls out of that what would conduct electricity? Your, your sixth grade science teacher, former one, is listening, so. Gum wrappers. Gum wrappers. What else? What? Paper clips, yeah. Money. Money. Chairs. Absolutely. Okay, you get the idea. Anything that conduct electricity. In fact, who was telling me, somebody was telling me before the session, was you talking about somebody at one of their sessions yesterday, they forgot their, their game controller or presenter mouse or something, so they made one out of Makey Makey and some money, which I thought was pretty great. Um, but anyway, so you're going to be one key. Here, you get to be this other key. Just hold the metal part. The red one has to be pinched. Yeah, no, <laughs> nobody has to pinch themselves. Except Scott. Scott, this one has to be pinched to your ear. I'm just kidding. Just hold it right there. And just hold your hands out here. And then Makey Makey also has what's called a ground. And all you have to do to make the keyboard do what it's supposed to do, hopefully, is com complete the circuit. And I hope I got these even in the right order. Let's wait. I don't know. Okay, so it should go. Pretty cool, huh? So wait, here we go. Come in tighter. Come yeah, come in a little tighter. tighter. Okay, here we go. Oh, again? Oh, again? Okay. You got it. Thank you very much. My sixth grade band teacher is so proud right now. Okay, ready? ready? Is this cool or what? Wait, where did I start? Yeah. There we go. There we go. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much for your help. I'll just be taking No, you don't get to take that. It's not, it's not a door prize. Yeah. Um, and that device costs, uh, I, want to, I don't remember the exact, it's like 47 49 something like that. Um, and I, I think I've got a link to the website. It's just makeymakey.com, I believe. Um, 
But lots of ways you could, you could go with that. You could in, do all kinds of inventing with that. Let me get back into the presentation here. Y'all actually were much better than trying to use strawberries or bananas or something for that. Oh, here's, here's a banana keyboard and a student playing it at our tech fair. Same, you get the idea there. All right, another, another thing that we are, we did not, okay, I'll have to be honest, we didn't get to this this year. This was in the plans, but we just frankly ran out of time. Our robotics just kept going and going as we added to this program. But it's Raspberry Pi. And is everybody familiar with Raspberry Pi? Some no's, good. So this, this will be exciting to you, and it'll, it should be exciting to everybody. This is a $37 computer. Now, actually, this one's 44 because I have this lovely $7 case I added to it. But what a Raspberry Pi is, a gentleman in the UK invented this. And he says his goal was to make it so that every kid could learn how to program and, and learn a computer and learn how a computer works and own their own computer. And it, it has everything a regular computer pretty much has, except you need a monitor and keyboard and mouse, which how many of you probably somewhere either in your home or your district have an old one that is not being used? I may have an old three in my house, as a matter of fact, like monitors. So you just hook those up. There's two different monitor cables connections, even an HDMI one. So you can get very good crisp. Uh, uh, resolution. There's an Ethernet connection, a couple of USB ports. Um, there is your hard drive actually sits on an SD card. And it's free, it's Linux. You can download that right off the internet and it'll run right there. So, and it has a few things on here. It has Scratch. This, it came with Python so the kids can learn to program and then step it up a little higher into Python and learning to program. But just the fact that it's Linux, it basically is designed for you to tweak and to mess with. And if you go online, you can find numerous student contests that have been set up where they're trying to get kids to invent things with this. Um, a friend of mine, after I talked to him about these, he ordered two of them and just couldn't wait. And so he went home and created a media system for his home that he uses an external hard drive and his Raspberry Pi and he can access all of his movies and everything straight from here. I've heard of people creating garage door, remote garage door openers they could access with their cell phones, plant waterers, I mean just you name it, people have, have created it with it. But that's the idea. He wanted people to get this in their hands and start making things. So for $37, that's a pretty good investment I would say. Um, and that's a little higher level and so this next year, this is that's going to be one of the things that we certainly implement. Little Bits is a good way to, it's kind of the other end of the spectrum. If I could have the Elmo one more time, please, sir. And if you've, now, Little Bits is designed to teach kids about how, just the basics of electronics and how they work and things, but without having to get solder burns. Any of you guys ever have the Radio Shack kits when you were a kid and know what I'm talking about, the little burns you get on your fingers from learning how to use those things, but the, the woman who invented this wanted people not to, I mean, to, they wanted it to be accessible to anybody and super easy to use, so she used magnets for the connections. And this is just, this is just a small sample of the types of pieces. There are types of switches like pressure switches and fans and different things like that that can go along with this as well. But basically it works like this. You have your power source. This one has a switch right here as well that can be turned on or off. Um, see, now it's turned on. Turn it off here for a second. This one's an electric motor. And what happens if you try to put it together the wrong way, what's going to happen with a magnet? It pushes it apart. So you have to push it in the right way. And I'm going to use one that actually you can see what it does um, right here. And this is another switch. It's a button switch and an extender. And then this one has some LED lights. If I turn this on, nothing happens yet. But if I press this switch, then my LED light comes on. And you can, you know, it's just an, a, a little simple to use invention kit that doesn't require any massive knowledge of, uh, you know, how to wire these things and, and how uh, electrical currents and things like that work. But it is a good way to get kids to start inventing things. And their site also, they do some good jobs of posing challenges and having people post their videos. And, and you'll see a lot of students uh, participating in that. But that was one of the first things I introduced to my kids and let them just start playing with. I will give this disclaimer, they are, they are a little pricey, but they periodically run sets. That's the best way to do it, because each one of these individual pieces can run you know, $12 or $15, depending on the piece, and you start trying to add that all up, and to me, that's, to me that's a little pricey, but hopefully they'll start coming down. They have a summer special right now that's like $50, I think. I just got an email from it the other day. That's a pretty good starter set. And that's called Little Bits. All right, 
Back to the computer, if you would, please. Thank you, sir. This is the kids playing with it on the first day, and they, they were making fans and little toy helicopters and stuff, and they were actually... Uh, some things that were semi-destructive. They were taking their Gatorade caps and somehow shredding them so that they could attach them to them, and it would cut paper, and they were just... It was just an experiment, just a, a day to play with it. I only gave them about an hour to play with that, and they were very ticked off when I said, all right, we're going to move on to the next thing. So next year, it's going to be a bigger player. Lego Robotics has certainly been uh, something that uh, I've wanted to implement for a while in, in, in my former district, and, and I'm getting to do it now. Um, okay. Uh, before I go to that, I'll kind of explain. What we did at first is we started real simply with, if you get the Lego robotics sets, they do have planned robots where you can say, this is exactly, here's, you follow this step, this step, this step, and this step, and you get a robot. Um, again, as with Scratch, my knowledge of Lego robotics is less than my nine-year-old's, and that is a fact. My nine-year-old got to be on a robotics team through our city library this year. And so I would very often say, can you tell me how I'm supposed to take the software and make the robot do this? He would say, well, yeah, Dad, duh, it's right here. And actually, he's, much, he's very patient with me, thank goodness. So he, and he's a good instructor, so he taught me how to do a lot of this. But as we did some of the, just the preliminary things, we started talking about challenges that we could do. And I know some of you all have heard, for example, uh, Dr. Gary Steger speak this week, right? Some of you? He, is, he has some good resources online about Lego Robotics and just kind of some open-ended challenges. And I borrowed some of those and started using them with the kids, and the kids came up with some of their own. Like, for example, how can you make a robot that can do something that's a fairly complex human task, like score a goal with a soccer ball? How can you make a robot that can draw a picture that actually looks like a picture? Sounds easy. It's not so. Or how do you make a robot that can play a musical instrument? And I'll show you one of the results here of the played musical instrument. This was after about probably about six hours of work that these students put in. I only know one song. All right, now I want to point out a couple of things. That, like I said, it took about six hours of work. And one of the cool things about doing this type of activity is you go through the whole engineering design process, which I'm oversimplifying it, but basically it means identify your problem, come up with some type of solution, build a prototype, test it, fail, likely, figure out what the heck went wrong, and then redo it and go through the whole process again until you get to the end result, right? And so that was... Little heads up here, and I, and I think this is because we don't give our kids chance to do this. I mentioned earlier that mistakes are okay. My son, who's nine and is brilliant, and in some ways it just scares me how smart he is. I just know he's going to rig the house to do something to me someday. Um, you know, yeah, remember when you grounded me that time? Okay. Um, but uh, he is, it, this frustrated the heck out of him because he's used to getting things right the first time, and he doesn't like making mistakes. But again, do we give them a chance to make mistakes in school? Well, if you make a mistake, what's your consequence? You might have to re... Huh? Corporal punishment. That's at home. That's once he gets home. You got a 90 on that test? No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, but it's, it's uh, what it's going to be. Redo the paper, kind of stay after school, blah, blah, blah. I mean, you know, it, it's a negative thing, right? I spent much time in this after-school program telling the kids, I love your mistakes. Those are great because what worked? What didn't work? How can you make it better? But, you know, with my son, it was like, just, you know, it was devastating to make mistakes the first couple of weeks of working on his robot. And they, they tried to make a robot that would draw a picture. And they created a prototype that was great. It would hold a pen, it would draw. The problem was the programming side, and they never quite got the programming right. It would draw a repetitive pattern, but it was of this big something. So, just, there's great value in teaching our kids it's okay, because they're going to face that sooner or later anyway, giving their kids opportunities to make mistakes. And I mentioned, I call it failure to succeed. Just, if we want our kids to be successful, especially in these innovative type fields, and then we need to give them opportunities to fail and learn how to deal with it and respond to it. And I love this. I got to go yesterday to a makerspace here for kids, here in San Antonio. Um, 
and they had this box setting there called Box of Fail, and this was some 3D printing that kids had done, and they were kind of celebrating all the things, all their prototypes that didn't work. Uh, so I was thinking about how I'm going to incorporate some kind of celebration of failure next year. Goes against the school normal school climate, doesn't it? Here's now. I also want to show this video and kind of explain. We just did a robotics camp last week, and I had some teenagers set up a course, and we had actually had a fire, a group of uh, firefighters come in that deal with hazardous chemicals, hazardous hazardous substances, and they talked about how robots could maybe help them do their thing. So the kids, the, my teenagers, set up a course for the younger kids to create a robot to go through and like what that one actually did is that, that red zone is a hot zone. They taught them about red zones, yellow zones, and green zones in the firefighting world. Um, and it's kind of hard to see but there's even like little things on the ground there for hazardous cargo markers and stuff on certain routes and stuff like that. So the, the kids knew they would get points if their robot could do certain things um, like go through that tunnel at the beginning go f sit for a few seconds in a hazardous zone and basically they said the, their idea was they were taking readings and then follow the hazardous cargo route out to go to the de decontamination area. Anyway, the kids had also heard the firefighters say, one of them I remember she specifically said it would be so useful if we had a camera on there in a way that we could see what was going on. So she said, I've got a cell phone, and this is on her own. I didn't tell her to do this. It wasn't on the score sheet. She created, she modded hers so that it would run with her cell phone. And then they were also using FaceTime to actually stream to another phone, you know, what the robot was seeing. Not control it, just show it. But the point, I was sharing this with some people. I was very excited about it, and I went and shared it with some people in the district. I said, you see what happens when sometimes when we just get out of the way? Their ideas are better than mine. And, and so I, that's why I wanted to show that off. I was so proud of those two girls coming up with that idea. And I, I said, y'all better send me a copy of that video. And they did. Um, some other things to share with you. DIY.org. Has anybody heard of this site? Uh, if you haven't, it's a really fascinating site. It's pretty new in the last year. Um, it is set up where you can set up a teacher or parent account um, and then uh, sign your kids up. And it offers challenges in a huge range of topics. The newest one that came out this week was be an entrepreneur. One of them that came out a couple weeks ago, and I was like, I'm going to have to try this because I don't know. It was be a sysadmin. You know, uh, they've got other ones about be a cardboard engineer, make things out of cardboard. Another one has to do with the one there on the left, tape ninja. Duct tape is like the force. It has a light side, a dark side, and it holds the universe together. And it, what you do when you go into these things is it will have a series of challenges for you to try to do, like construct a tape wallet, accessorize with tape, construct a tape bag, make tape shoes, fix something from tape, construct a tape hammock. Uh, and generally they'll get kind of harder and harder. And the kids are then supposed to submit their pictures or videos of their solved problems and they earn badges. But it's, it's great. If any of you were like me and were the type that like to take apart things at home that you probably weren't supposed to take apart or get into dad's tools and, and the shed and just make stuff and things, this is, this is your heaven. But it's, it's, not, and it's not just electronics. They have all kinds of things. They have sewing. They have cooking. Here's one for chef. Here's one for building rockets, a bike mechanic, beekeeper. I'm not going to, I'm not going to advocate that necessarily. That one sounds a little interesting, but it might be cool. Backyard farmer. Uh, lots of tech stuff. Here's a cryptographer, data visionary. They've got another one about hacker. Uh, here's the entrepreneur one, the newer one, entomologist. So it covers a wide range of stuff. Very cool site, free. If you've got kids at home, especially this might be a good way to, when they say they're bored, you say, go earn some badges or something, you know, and get them started in this. So that's DIY.org. Uh, another thing you, that you may or may not have heard of is something called Squishy Circuits. And Squishy Circuits are a good fun project to get kids started learning about electronics and, and the technology and inventing things as well. Basically, and there's a couple of recipes on their website. And their website, I do have the link to it um, on, the, on the links I'll share at the end. Um, they, you make conductive dough and you make um, insulating dough. 
And then you can start inventing from there. And you can see they're using just, uh, and I thought I had one while ago. They're just using, this is too many toys over here. They're just using LED diodes. You can get a Radio Shack for just a few cents. And then creating things with that using this dough. Great way, great tool, uh, tool for younger kids as well. A uh, little heads up, I've had much better luck with 9 volt batteries than with just like C or D batteries as far as having enough power to go through the conductive dough and, you know, but uh, anyway, there's a lot of good project ideas on their side as well. I'll also give you this little heads up. I don't remember if it's a conductive or an insulative dough. One of them will start to mold after about two weeks. So you can do some science experiments on DIY.org, I think, with what you created on squishy circuits. It does start to get a little funky, um, so just keep that in mind. It's a temporary tool. Oh. Y'all seen this? This is Sylvia's super awesome mini maker show, and she has, and I have a link to this as well, she has a page on YouTube where she just invents stuff, creates stuff, does science experiments, and this, I, I put it up there because she actually has a segment on, on um, squishy circuits. Welcome to Sunny Super Awesome Mini Maker Show, Season 2, Episode 7! Are you curious about experimenting with electronics, but the fear of electric shock or soldering iron burns keep you away? Why not try Squishy Circuits? Okay, you can watch that on, you know, the whole thing later. But is there any reason that your students couldn't create a series of videos like that? These are not high-dollar productions, but they're just great. And uh, I really applaud whoever it is, her mom, dad, teacher that, you know, got her rolling in this. I've not read the background story, but I love this series and sharing it with, I like sharing it with students as well. Uh, Tinker.com is a website that's very much like Scratch. It looks like Scratch, but here's the advantage. You can set up a teacher account, and then you can create student accounts, which then you can manage in the sense that you can kind of monitor what they're, not monitor as much as just kind of keep track of what they're creating with their programming. And uh, you can also go in there and offer challenges and stuff. For example, you can pull a program out of there and and scramble it and say something's not working can you debug this program and assign that to them and they can go in and fix the program and and but you actually can view the work of all your students and it's free as well um, I do think you have to request to join but and it might take a couple of days but they're pretty quick so uh, oh, I just heard about this yesterday WikiSeat um, uh, I met a, a, a guy from a uh, Canada named Jared, and I'm going to blank on his last name, and I feel like a dope. But anyway, who, when we went to the makerspace here in San Antonio, he was talking about he's done this with his high school students. This is a company out of California that they send these, they call them catalysts. This is the catalyst right here that you're looking at. And it is three metal pieces of uh, angle iron welded together, and it, they, they don't charge anything technically. They ask for a donation of $5. It costs a dollar per... Uh, device to ship because it's about a dollar per pound and these are about a pound and what kids are supposed to do is create a stool or a seat from this in any way they want taking it in any direction they want and what you'll see the schools on if you go to their website and look at what the schools are doing they're doing things like they're having gallery tours of the stools at the end I was talking to Jared about the fact I said I think what I would like to do is maybe have my have some of our high school kids or whatever do this and then do like a charity auction of the stools for some local charity or things like that after we do the gallery show um, but they get very creative and very artistic there's no one right way and then the company will actually send you they will share they have an instructable they will share the plans for how to make one of these which I mean it's really not hard but they will share them with you. So if you have like a, a metal shop in your district or even just a local you know, metal fabricator that might you could partner with, you could even get them cheaper and they'll tell you exactly, you know, this is the angle iron you use, you can order it from wherever and how to put it together. Um, but a great way to just stir some creative, innovative thinking. Um, I've seen some funny and some really, some really practical, comfortable looking stools and then I saw one today that you know, had a toilet seat as its seat, and the seat back as its back, you know, it, they're teenagers, so of course they're going to go there at some point. Um, but uh, just a wonderful, I love this project idea, and that's at wikiseat.org. 
Uh, okay, I mentioned earlier that there, the program that uh, I thought was maybe even better for primary kids than Scratch, um, just as an intro, and this is called Hopscotch. Uh, it is, here's what it looks like. It's just a simple app. It's free for the iPad, and it's, it only is on the iPad right now. They don't have it for Android devices. I don't know if they're going to develop it or not, but it works with the same kind of interface as Scratch where you... Uh, drag your actions and the controls for those actions like this one they have it programmed where that character when they when they tap the object the character will move a hundred whatever spaces rotate 90 degrees and leave a trail as it does like leave a line and then it will repeat that five times and scale it by 100 percent 110 percent so it'll get larger as it goes through the process but it's just a really easy way for kids to start learning it. There's a lot of math concepts and logic involved in this too. You see the X, Y axis at the top? Same thing with Scratch. Um, if your kids, you know, if, you, if you're a math teacher and you know that your kids have trouble with, you know, all of that, the, the axes and, and, and dealing with it, this is a great way to make it real comfortable and familiar with them and then apply it in a way that they don't even think they're doing math, but they are. As I start telling them, you want your character to move where? Well, what's the point on the X, Y axis? And they, it's real easy for them to calculate it on there and stuff. So uh, anyway, that is hopscotch. So what are some next steps for where we're going? Um, really, we're trying to get more community involvement. And I'm already getting some people that are a gentleman who's a retired engineer has come into my office and spent an hour and a half one day recently talking about how he could be involved in some of this with our students and help them learn how to be innovators and engineers. And his ideas just, you know, were phenomenal. Um, so we're going to bring him in, talk with some local businesses, which we're already having conversations with, expand those. To have more teams, I've got, like I said, this was just a, a pilot program this year, but I've got, for example, my two middle schools, I have people at both middle schools saying, we want this at our school, we want that. Plus the kids that were on this, in our district, sixth grade is a standalone campus, and the parents of the kids that were in it were like, we want this at the middle school. So we're going to add it at the middle school um, at the very least this year. And this was a big thing. We, want, we need one... I, I didn't, think, I didn't think about this being an issue, but when we had our original, at least at that age, when I had kids sign up, I had one girl out of 18 kids. One girl. And she was phenomenal. In fact, she walked in the first day, her eyes got about this big. I was like, ah, you're staying. I need you. I want you in here. You need to be here. And she was such a good kid. She's so smart and, and uh, was a good balance to just the craziness of the boys at times. I never had been a GT teacher. I've always just taught regular self-contained. I don't know how this GT, because really a lot of these, I, I liken this to a GT kids because of the way their minds work. And some of them were, but some of them weren't. But when you got them all together, it was really controlled chaos and at times not even fully controlled. Um, but anyway, uh, Amber was really good. So next year we're already talking about ways that we're going to recruit, actively recruit girls to be a part of this. Because they, you know, I, I've gone to high school robotics contests and it's about 50-50. Um, so something at that, at least in our district at that younger age, I don't know if, if I didn't advertise it well or what, they just weren't interested. I'm going to try to, you know, I don't know if there's some kind of stigma or whatever, but we're going to try to get more of them involved for sure. Uh, and then we're also talking about doing some maker spaces in the district, uh, maybe through our local community uh, rec center. Um, and also the discussion, and if any of y'all are from this area, we've started having some discussions about with, between San Antonio and Austin areas, maybe having a youth maker fair next year. Um, so contact me. I'd be glad to have your contributions to help them with that. Um, and then the, the last and most important thing is just we're still working with teachers to kind of change their classroom expectations to show them how you can do more of this stuff in your science curriculum, in your math curriculum, even in your language arts curriculum, anything, uh, how you can incorporate more of this stuff. And then I, I always wanted to have somebody doing these presentations in a big room like this and quote me, so I'm going to do it. The real value of the Lego set doesn't come up until, I can't even excuse, doesn't come until the kid takes it apart and realizes they've lost the instructions. I see this all the time in my son. I, I love, by the way, one thing I didn't mention there, I'm going to back up just for a hair before, is I didn't mention Minecraft. And I really see a lot of value in Minecraft. Of all the video games my son wants to play, he wants to play Minecraft the most. And it is a very creative, innovative game. He'll come to me and say, Dad, look at this I built. And it's this incredible city that they build brick by brick by brick by brick. 
and it'll have 40 buildings spread out over three islands. This building does this and this building, and the amount of logic and thought and planning that goes in, into it. And they can also do it socially because the, you can play multiplayer and create cities, and he has his little friends over, and you know, we would play the Atari together. They're instead, they're creating things in, in, mine, in Minecraft, so I really do like that. Um, but I, I always am, am most amazed at what my son does. Not when he's a Lego fanatic, has been since he was a little bitty. Uh, not by what he does when he gets the instructions and follows the instructions and puts together, you know, the Death Star or whatever. But what he does within a week after he's destroyed the Death Star and starts really getting creative. Um, that's when really the, I think the, the, the magic happens. In, and it's a great environment at home because he can't screw up. There's no mistake he can possibly make, so that's when he gets the most inventive and creative. Um, and I guess that would be my challenge is that for you guys, too, to build opportunities for your kids to do that, to just explore, to create, to invent without worrying about that was the wrong answer and things like that. If that's an after-school program, great. And if you'd like information about the things that we used and the, and the methods that we used to get that started, I'd be happy to, to share that, you know, discuss that with you at any time. Um, but uh, ultimately, if we can start figuring out ways to do this in our classrooms more often, we're going to be even better off. So I think that's about it. My contact information is right there if you need. I, I'm at R. Rogers on Twitter, and uh, that's my blog is the middle one, and all my other information is at that first website. But that's all. Do you have any questions or anything you want to add or things maybe that I didn't share that you thought would add to it? Yes, ma'am. Pardon? The, if you go to, uh, oh, oh, if you go to Moss Freestone, that's where all the links are. Actually, that presentation and all the links. Thank you for asking that. That's all I have. Thank you guys very much for coming on the last day. Thanks, sir. And enjoy, enjoy the keynote. We've got one more, right? Yeah. Yo, this was the keynote. Yes, I hope you enjoyed the keynote. Yeah. Thank you all very much for coming. <laughs>